All right. Oh, too hot, Kevin. Thank you. So, hello everyone. It's good to be here uh, sharing God's Word with you today. If you would join me in a word of prayer as we enter our time in God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for um, your living word. We know that you speak to us in many ways, in dreams and visions, in, um, in the people around us, godly people around us speaking into our lives, in your supernatural peace that falls on us, but uh, you especially speak to us through your living word. And so thank you for that word that transforms hearts and minds. We ask that you would be here with us as we um, enter into it, that we would hear what you want us to hear, and nothing that comes from me, but only what comes from you. And so uh, we give you this time, Lord. We give you our heart's attention. Um, we love you and pray all this in your name. Amen. So I need to do a little bit of a recap because it has been several weeks since we've been in our Revelation series, uh, a series that we titled a while back um, with the end in view. But uh, I think if you're anything like me, most of us probably don't quite remember exactly what we've talked about so far. So a quick recap, we started this series almost three months ago at the end of January, um, talking about what does it really mean for the end to come, for this messianic kingdom of Jesus to be ushered in, and how we're supposed to live in light of that. That was uh, Pastor Ted that very first week. We followed that up with four weeks straight of looking at um, Jesus' messages to the seven churches of Revelation. Douglas covered two, I, uh, Pastor Ted covered three, I covered one, and then Douglas covered one at the very end. And each of those churches are a little bit different. Do you guys remember this like church health report card that we talked through? Um, the, there were two churches that we considered like the A-plus churches because they had undergone significant suffering and they had held fast to the faith that they had not compromised what they believed and continued to, um, to trust and follow Jesus. Then there were some churches that we would maybe categorize as like C plus, or if you're using the Asian American grading scale, like B plus, A minus churches, who for the most part were doing well, but um, they were in danger of compromising their faith. And so Jesus gives a warning to those churches not to give in to the things that they were being tempted by by the world around them. And then um, the last two weeks, we looked at two churches that really were, um, were failing, that they had dropped the ball or fallen asleep doing what God had called them to do. And so it was a, a clear wake-up call, uh, a rebuke to them to start living the way that they were supposed to live that God had called them. After that, Pastor Ted took us into Revelation chapter 5 and really unpacked this beautiful image of this uh, scroll that's in heaven. And it's a scroll that is sealed, it's closed, and no one is able to open it or read it except Jesus. And that was uh, a reminder to us that this scroll contains all of human history, all of our lives, and really the Lord is in control of that. And so it was this, this hopeful reminder to us that despite not knowing a lot of what will happen as uh, the end comes, that God has us, that he's sovereign over us, and that he calls us to really follow him and live in light of that trust in him. So today, I want to continue our series in the, in the book of Revelation. We're only having maybe uh, two or three more weeks after this here. Um, and we're going to look at a passage that has really challenged and um, spoken to me even in the last couple of years. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 to 12, or you can follow along as I read it um, on the screen. So Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 to 12, this is in the English Standard Version. It says this, um, this is the Apostle John recording his vision of the, the end of time. So it says this, After this I, that's John, looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne <clears throat> and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. In his vision, John is brought into the throne room of God. Just before this, he actually sees a pretty big crowd, a crowd of 144,000 um, from the tribe of Israel. This, uh, many people think that this is the remnant of Israel that the Lord um, saves for himself. And so there's 144,000 people 
possibly actually 144,000, or maybe allegorically, it's to save the full family of Israel that's been saved by God. Regardless of what you think about it, whether it's literally or, uh, or allegorical, um, what we do know is that John sees first a group of people that is numbered, and then he sees a great multi- multitude that he's unable to number. Right? These people, he look, looks, and they're all dressed in white. Now, when I read this for the first time, I think it reminded me of like a sporting event. Right? If you go watch, like right now it's playoff basketball. My Chicago Bulls are getting their butts kicked, so it's really, really hard being a Bulls fan right now. But if you go to a playoff basketball game, a playoff football game, or any sort of like significant sporting event, usually people dress in their team colors. Right? And so that's, that was the first thought that I had when I thought of like everyone's wearing these white robes. Um, <clears throat> when I was a, uh, a youth pastor at my previous church, I made this mistake of bringing two students of mine to downtown Chicago one uh, Saturday or Sunday afternoon to go celebrate the Blackhawks finally winning the Stanley Cup after like 40 years or something like that. And so these students who were both hockey fans were all wearing red t-shirts because that's the Blackhawks color. And we take the train down into the city, we get off the train, and I, like an idiot, thought I'd be able to keep track of them in this sea of Blackhawks fans. And probably within 10 minutes, they disappeared, and I had no idea where they were. And I spent 30 minutes in panic looking for these two students amidst this huge sea of red. I don't think I've ever seen that many people gathered in one space. It was um, a rally that kind of took place in the middle of the heart of downtown Chicago. And so it was just a sea of people wearing red. Uh, thankfully, I did find those students. I did not get fired from my job that weekend. Um, but I remember thinking, again, that I have never seen so many people in one place before. But the thing is that after that rally ended, they actually were able to estimate roughly how many people were in the streets of Chicago that day for the rally. It was about 2 million people gathered celebrating the Blackhawks winning the Stanley Cup. And so even in my mind, this seemingly innumerable number was actually, they were able to estimate a number, right? And so what that tells me is that as big as that crowd was, this crowd that John sees in the throne room of heaven, this great multitude, is even bigger than that. It's so big that John cannot number it even if he wanted to. Probably the people go farther than the eye can see. And what this tells us is that this crowd, this multitude, is the gathering of God's people from, past, pres- from every generation, past, present, and future, gathered together, worshiping God in the throne room. John clues us into a very specific detail about this great multitude. He tells us that this multitude consists of people from every nation. Uh, today, in our world, there are roughly 195, 93, depending on how you're counting, nations in existence. I think according to the UN uh, roster, it's 193. And so that's already a lot of different uh, national groups, if we say every nation, at least existing today. But we know that despite there being uh, 193-something countries, not every people group has a country to call their own. And even within certain countries, there's multiple subgroups and subcultures of people that they would identify with specific ethnic groups or cultural groups. And so for, for us, when we talk about uh, a wide breadth of diversity, you can't just talk about nations. You actually have to talk about more, and that's what John is doing here. Every nation is not sufficient to capture the fullness of, of diversity in this multitude. He goes on to tell us that all tribes and peoples and languages are represented. He's, John is making it abundantly clear that this great multitude in heaven that he sees in the throne room, of, throne room of God sufficiently encompasses all the different people groups that have existed for all of eternity. What John is describing in his vision and what we have to look forward to because we're part of that great group, that great multitude, yeah. is that we belong to a diverse kingdom family. Right? We belong to a diverse kingdom family. Uh, I did this exercise a little bit this morning at San Jose Christian Alliance Church, which is a very different congregation than the one here. So I'm interested how it's going to feel. But let's use it, using this room as an illustration, this is a New Vine Community Church, um, a church plant of San Jose Christian Alliance Church, which that church is a Chinese heritage church. And if you look at this congregation, you would not necessarily say that this is a Chinese heritage church, right? There are Chinese people here, but it was not, this church was not planted to necessarily reach Chinese people, 
right? If you look at the people in here um, and categorize people by nationality, I would say not everyone, but there's probably quite a few people in here that hold American passports. You're a US citizen, um, and so we would say that the majority, though not all, uh, if we categorize by nationality, is American. If you um, switch to talking about the languages represented here, well, for sure, most of us definitely speak English, though I know that Kitty works very hard in the back to translate into Cantonese for a few folks here. And I would venture a guess that though most of you speak English, many of you are probably either biling bilingual or trilingual, and your first language may not necessarily be in English. And so there's a diverse spread, very different kinds of people here, speaking different languages. If you, zoom, uh, if you expand that, these categories even more, from nationality to language, and now to uh, people groups and culture groups, when we were at San Jose Christian Alliance this morning, there were pockets of junior hires, high schoolers, young adults, uh, families with teenagers, empty nesters, retired folks. There was a whole uh, spectrum of that, and we actually have most of that represented here, too. In this congregation, there's people that are, or in this New Vine Community Church, there's people that are Vietnamese, Vietnamese Chinese, Chinese American, Korean American, Latino, white, Desi. If Pastor Ted were here, we would have a Korean Canadian too. This is an expansive, diverse group of people because I couldn't even list all of the different uh, sub-ethnic groups and cultural groups that are represented in this church family. It's a beautiful picture of what the diversity of the kingdom family is supposed to look like. But the thing is that the vision that John sees in Revelation 7-9 is actually even more diverse and greater and more beautiful than even the picture that we have here at New Vine. It's really something that we have to look forward to. He has to use, John has to use the language of all nations, tribes, peoples, and languages in order to sufficiently capture exactly who the family of God is supposed to be. When Instagram, the social media app, for those of you who don't know what that is, um, when it first came out, what set it apart as a photo sharing app was one of the things that you could do with Insta Instagram very easily is that you could take a color photo and then you could like throw a filter on it. And it would change, you know, it would make like normal photographers or like amateur photographers or terrible photographers like myself actually seem like they knew what they were doing by just sliding a filter on. And so some of the filters that you have with Instagram are like very monotone. You can take a color photo, throw the filter on, and all of a sudden you have a black and white photo or you have like a sepia tone photo or something like that. And sometimes I feel like, especially when I was growing up, this is what I was told about my ethnicity. The fact that I am a Chinese American. That no matter the background, or our ethnicity, that we, in some ways, have had to suppress or filter who we are in order to fit in with the whole, in order to fit in with the larger group. But that's not what happens here in the throne room of heaven. When John looks at the crowd just by his eyesight, he's able to see that there's different people represented here. And what that tells me is that heaven, the throne room of God, is uh, we're not going to be having a filter on it. It's not going to be monotone or everyone just looks the same. We're, gonna, we're not going to be colorblind in, uh, in the throne room of God. Growing up, I think I was told that being colorblind was a good thing, that uh, we, ought to, we ought not to judge people based on the color, the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. And I actually think that that's still true. Um, there's not, nothing wrong with that. But in the context of the kingdom of God, being colorblind actually, especially when you're looking at yourself or at others, uh, being colorblind actually is ignoring who God has made us to be. That if we look at a person and say, well, I don't see your ethnicity, I don't see your, uh, who you are or the culture, cultural group that you belong to, if we ignore that, we're ignoring how God has made us. Why does this matter? It matters because the kingdom, uh, the, what does matter is that our kingdom family is diverse. And because a diverse, we have a diverse multi-ethnic kingdom, it actually points us to our multi-ethnic savior. Jesus, who uh, his parents, Joseph and Mary, were, were Jewish uh, by nationality or ethnicity, though he's king of the Jews, let's not forget that he actually has the blood of Rahab, a woman from Jericho, and the blood of Ruth, a Moabite woman, running through his veins. A diverse, multi-ethnic kingdom points us to a multi-ethnic savior. 
and a diverse, multifaceted kingdom filled with people from all different cultures points us to a multifaceted Jesus. Each culture, each cultural group, when fully redeemed and sanctified by the Holy Spirit, is going to reveal a different facet of Jesus' character. And it's definitely going to have to be when our, our cultures are redeemed by God. Because we know that for sure in a lot of different cultural groups, there are parts of who we are that don't point people to Jesus and don't honor the Lord. And so we have to run it through um, just the purifying work of the Holy Spirit to take what's good about who we are and use those to bless the church, bless the people of God, point them to Jesus, and then let the things of us that are not from the Lord to just kind of filter away in that process. Ultimately, in the throne room of God, the biblical ideal is not a melting pot of cultures where everything blends together. That's not what the kingdom is. Instead of a melting pot, it's actually a mosaic. A mosaic is like a piece of artwork where rather than, um, they have multiple little tiles, and each tile is a different color, and the tiles are arranged to form a bigger picture with those tiles. That's what the kingdom of God is. That each person, each cultural group that's represented in the diverse kingdom family actually points us to a greater picture of who we're supposed to be as God's family. While this end times gathering is going to be a diverse celebration of who God has made us to be, this great multitude, however, does have a singular work that they're supposed to accomplish together. Right? So even though we are a diverse kingdom family, we are also called to have a single-minded kingdom purpose. All these different expressions of the kingdom doing the same thing. In verse 10 of chapter 7, it says this, Crying out with a loud voice, this crowd or this multitude says, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's our purpose. When we are standing together with the full family of God, we'll have nothing to worry about except to worship God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. This multitude is declaring together that salvation belongs to God, that he is the finisher of this work of salvation. It's the bookend to the cry of the early church of the disciples when they said that salvation is found in no one except Jesus. And because of this truth, our God who sits on the throne over all things is worthy of our worship. That's what the family of God's going to do when we're gathered together. Uh, again, we did this this morning, and uh, I'd like to try it here. So because the family of God is supposed to declare that um, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Uh, I want us to just say that together. All right, so are we able to put that on the screen, Kelvin? Excellent. All right, so ready? Let's just uh, declare this together. One, two, three. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Okay, that was, uh, the first attempt was stronger than San Jose's first attempt this morning. So I want to try it again with everybody standing up and declar declaring with a loud voice together, all right? One, two, three. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Okay, that's pretty good. Um, I can tell that Angus has had a long day and it, that he's tired. So Angus, I need you to wake up and lead the people with the fullness of who you are, all right? So one last time. One, two, three. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. That's a good practice for when we are in the throne room of heaven together. But when we're up in the throne, maybe not necessarily up, but when we are in the throne room of heaven together, what language do you think this loud cry will be in? Obviously here, for, for the most part, we all speak English. So that's why, that's why we said that in English. Do you think maybe we will supernaturally learn Hebrew, the language of God's people, when we're, when we're in the throne room of heaven? Or hopefully, if you're like me and a little bit of a nerd when it comes to Koine Greek, we'll find a way to uncover a dead language and we'll all speak in Greek because that's the language that Revelation is written in. If it's all in one language... How does John know that there will be many languages represented in this great multitude? I think that John is hearing all of the people crying out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb in their own individual languages. We already know from Acts 2, which we talked about, I think, last summer, so almost a year ago now, 
Uh, we already know from this specific moment in the early church in Acts chapter 2 that God can supernaturally allow us to understand languages that we are not familiar with. So here, I think in my sanctified imagination, it doesn't say exactly what John experienced or felt. But I imagine that in this vision from God, John is able to hear this declarative cry that the full family of God says. He's able to hear it in all the many languages that are uh, represented in this great multitude. I'm confident that this is how it's going to be when we're gathered together worshiping God. And not just for this specific statement, but when we are invited to join in the full song of heaven, that it won't be in one language, but it will be, uh, that it won't be in one language that we all have to assimilate to, but it will rather be languages that represent who God has made us to be and the families that we come from. This is going to be a resounding chorus uh, of all the languages represented by the kingdom family. And while the expressions and language of these, this single-minded cry is going to be um, different, the single purpose stays the same across all generations, across all people. Our call is to declare the saving power and glory of our eternal God and King. And so the same way that a choir is better when the singers sing many different parts in harmony rather than everyone just singing the same tune, the same melody, our cry in heaven from a multitude of diverse people with diverse languages will be a sweeter sound to God who sits on the throne. We'll have one song, but many, many voices singing it. And while we have this to look forward to, because we belong to that diverse kingdom family, and we'll have this single-minded purpose in heaven, the reality is that this actually matters for us today also. It's not just for when the time comes, but it's for right now also. Because this isn't just a vision of things to come. We are actually living in a presently realized kingdom vision. Right? We are living in a presently realized kingdom vision. What John sees is actually what we are supposed to be pursuing now as the people of God. In Matthew chapter 6, when Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, he tells them to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So our hope and our prayer and our longing is for this vision of the throne room of God to be realized here on earth as it is in heaven. We're supposed to be pursuing this diverse, multifaceted kingdom family with the single-minded kingdom purpose today. Not just waiting for uh, some time to come, but to really pursue it in our own lives, and our own churches today. Now, in a church like San Jose Christian Alliance Church, it can feel a little more difficult to see this because that's a predominantly Chinese church, even though it's not entirely Chinese. We have two Chinese congregations. We have an English-speaking congregation made up of second, third, and fourth generation um, Chinese Americans, along with a lot of other different folks who speak English in that congregation, and that's a beautiful thing. And I think here in this church, New Vine, it's probably a little bit easier to understand the fullness of that, uh, what that really looks like to pursue this uh, diverse kingdom family here on earth as it is in heaven. But I just want to remind you that despite how many different people we have in this church family, and it's, it's really a great thing, a wonderful thing, um, we're only scratching the surface of what that big C church, what that kingdom family is supposed to look like. Because the local church, this church, San Jose Christian Alliance Church, or even the American church is not... Uh, the big C church. The big capital C church consists of all of the people of God for all eternity, and that's not centered on just one expression of the church or just one nation on just America. We're part of a much bigger whole. In our denomination, which is the Christian and, Christian and Missionary Alliance, the Alliance family, um, there are about 15, 1,700 churches here in the U.S., I believe. I may have mixed that number up, but it's under 2,000 churches here in the U.S., which is already a fairly large number of churches. And there's churches of all shapes and sizes, right? Uh, I think San Jose Christian Alliance Church would be considered one of the bigger ones. New Vine would be actually right in the average uh, of the size of church in the Alliance family. But actually, if you pay attention to who we are in the CMA, you'll realize that even these 1,700 or so churches in the U.S. Alliance family is just a small piece of the puzzle of who we really are. The CMA, or the Alliance, belongs to a network of Alliance churches called Alliance World Fellowship. 
And it's a, an organization of all the churches that belong to the CMA from all over the globe. There's actually 80 countries represented in this, uh, in this Alliance World Fellowship. And that's just in our denomination. If you add in other denominations, right, the Assemblies of God um, or the E-Free Church, all the other uh, lots of different denominations, you'll realize that we actually belong to a really diverse and wonderful kingdom family. Admittedly, it can be whole, uh, hard to hold this in balance, right? Two things, that we are both a part of a bigger whole, but also without losing sight of who we are, who God has made us to be. In my own life, or in my own story, um, for the most part, when I was in elementary school, junior high, and high school, I went to public school. And in public school, when you're surrounded by a lot of non-Christians, I basically gave up on trying to live in a redeemed, uh, united uh, culture. All right? I experienced um, teasing or bullying because of my ethnicity, because of the things that I ate, who I was. And I, honestly, I think by the time I hit high school, I just hung out mostly with um, Asian, uh, East Asian or South Asian students. And uh, that was mostly my friend group. And didn't really think too much about what is my own ethnic identity. Growing up, my whole life, I went to a Chinese heritage church. That's a church, again, that uh, is formed to reach the Chinese diaspora. And um, by the time I got to college, I started attending a, a pan-Asian or Asian-American um, church that predominantly was a bunch of young adult Asians, college students, and grad students. And so that was also a very, um, not a very diverse uh, church family, even though it was probably a little bit more diverse than my church in Chicago's Chinatown. And so it wasn't really until I got to uh, the second half of my time in college when I got to Moody Bible Institute and uh, felt the Lord calling me into pastoral ministry that I really began to wrestle with who am I and what's my identity when it comes to following Jesus. I loved my time at Moody, so I, I, when I talk about this story, I don't want it to sound like I didn't appreciate it my time there. Um, but there were some hard moments when I was a student at Moody. And you would think that in a Christian environment with, with other people who are looking to go into full-time Christian ministry, that this would really be the place where I could be who God has made me to be, right? That I could fully um, live in my identity and, and how God has formed me as a uh, Chinese American, soon to be pastor at that time. But the reality was that more often than not, I actually felt like I had to self-erase parts of, my, of who I am, or I had to joke about my own identity um, as a way to fit in with people who weren't like me. This is not how the kingdom of God is supposed to be. This is not how the family of God is supposed to be. It wasn't until my time as a youth pastor serving in uh, a Chinese church, but serving alongside ministries that were not like mine, and having partnerships with other youth groups from a Korean church, a Filipino church, a Vietnamese church, uh, a Hmong church, um, and many, many other churches in that area. It was then that I really began to explore who I am as a Chinese person and as a Chinese pastor serving in a Chinese heritage church. The more I explored my own ethnic identity, the more I came to understand my own value and the place that I had in the kingdom of God, and as I understood myself and who God made me to be, that really helped me to see the value and place in the kingdom of people who were not like me. That the more I saw that how God made me was beautiful and valued and important to the full family of God, it helped me to see how other people were important and beautiful and valued in the family of God. It's important for us, especially in the family of God, to sit with and learn from people who are different from us. There's a richness that's evidenced in the full body of Christ that we miss out on when we don't seek out the diverse kingdom family on earth as it is in heaven. I want to learn from all the different parts of the body of Christ. I want to learn from the prayer life of the Korean church. I want to learn from the worship culture of the black church. I want to learn from the familiar, familial nature of the Latino church. I want to learn from the long-suffering perseverance of the immigrant church, of which I am a part of and a product of. I want to learn from the hospitality of the Arabic church. And there's so much more that God has made his people to be. And in all of these, these things, we see a deeper, richer picture of Jesus. 
when we hold these two things together, that our redeemed cultures matter and that we belong to a much bigger whole, we recognize that every church has a role to play as part of the global body of Christ. Uh, San Jose Christian Alliance Church has two church plants. New Vine is one of them. New Spring is the other one. So New Vine's here in Mountain View. New Spring is in Milpitas. If you look at the congregations of New Vine and New Spring, they are very, very different. New Vine, you guys already know. This is who we are. New Spring is, a pre- is not even predominantly. That's probably not the the word. It's an exclusively, almost, um, Chinese Mandarin-speaking congregation. It's very different from from New Vine. Both of these churches have value and bring something to the table for the kingdom of God and are important. And we need to have both churches uh, to reach different groups of people, different types of people, and they bring something to the table. For a monocultural church, monoethnic for a Chinese heritage or ethnic heritage church like New, uh, New Spring. Churches like that teach the big C church, the kingdom of God, the value of each culture and ethnicity. And they shine a spotlight on the kingdom value and perspective that we bring to the full family of God. For a multi-ethnic church like New Vine, we teach the big C church the beauty of people from many backgrounds and cultures worshiping our multi-ethnic king together. There are churches like San Jose Christian Alliance, which are maybe a little bit more in the center between those two opposite ends of the spectrum. And all these different churches across the spectrum are necessary to get a full picture of what the kingdom of God should look like on earth as it is in heaven. So we belong to a diverse kingdom family. We are called to a single-minded kingdom purpose. And we are currently and presently living in a realized kingdom vision. I want to invite each of you to explore the richness and fullness of this kingdom family. For, some of you, uh, for each of you, that's probably going to look a little bit different. Maybe some of you, it means wrestling with your own cultural and ethnic identity as you explore who God has made you to be. That's something that I started wrestling with in college and I'm still wrestling and trying to figure it out now. For others, maybe you are fairly sure of who you are and who God has made you to be. And it means... The next step is building relationships with people in the full family of God who are not like you. Perhaps it's sitting with somebody different for dinner here at New Vine each week. Or maybe it's even checking out the services at Chinese, uh, San Jose Christian Alliance Church in the morning on Sundays because it's going to have a different feel from New Vine. And just sitting with people that, who might be a little bit different from you. If you don't know, San Jose Christian Alliance also has several partner congregations that potentially you could visit, though... We haven't cleared it with any of their pastors, so maybe don't go all at the same time. But we have a Vietnamese congregation, an Arabic congregation, a Cambodian congregation, uh, all that meets at San Jose Christian Alliance either on Sunday or on Saturday. For some of you, maybe you have already been doing both of those things already. And so it's possible that God is calling you today to go and build bridges into communities and places that have yet to see the beauty of the full, diverse kingdom family. God is sending you into those places to really, uh, yeah, speak of the greatness of who he is. Because we would not have this diverse kingdom family if our God himself uh, did not value these things and celebrate what he has made. So in all this, as a church family, New Vine Community Church, may we declare together as a kingdom family that is diverse, may we declare together that salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Let's pray. God in heaven, we know that you have made us and placed us in the families that you've placed us, in the cultures that you've placed us. And there are parts of who we are that uh, are not pleasing to you, but there are also parts of who we are that are beautiful, that are God-given and God-honoring. And you've created us and put us in these places, not so that we could keep it to ourselves, but so that we can share it with the full family of God. Lord, help us to see the parts of who we are that honor you and to really Uh, celebrate those, celebrate those in ourselves, celebrate those in others. Lord, may we see a deeper, richer picture of Jesus in one another in the way that you've made us. We love you, Lord. We pray all this in your name. Amen.